I think one very big thing in, in my experience working with international student population is that a lot of international students come from collectivistic cultures where, you know, there's a lot of uh, dependence and reliance on family and friends and that Im immediate network. And when you come here to the U.S., you don't have anyone. Mm -hmm. You're alone. All your closest people are like on the other side of the world, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 miles away. And, and that's, that's huge. Welcome to the Sojourner Scholar Podcast. While studying abroad can be one of the most rewarding experiences in your life, it also comes with a different set of challenges, one of which is culture shock and its impact on your mental health. That's why I'm stoked for the conversation with today's guest, Dr. Honor Erega. Dr. Erega shares the identity of a former elite international student athlete. She competes in Division I intercollegiate athletics and pursued her dreams in the professional track and field arena as an Olympic hopeful for Croatia. Today, she's a licensed clinical mental health counselor and a certified mental performance consultant with a passion for supporting student athletes and international students in achieving success in their respective arenas. In this episode, we discuss some of the unspoken truths of studying abroad and how to adapt to a new culture as an international student. So whether you are a prospective or current international student, there are tons of gems you will be taken away from this episode. So let's get into it. Dr. Honor, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me and thank you for the lovely introduction too. Absolutely. It's so interesting to see your background coming to the States on a D1 athletic scholarship. I don't think I've come across anyone who's performed at that level, but also the fact that you went forward to turn pro, getting ready for the Olympics and really competing at a very high level. But I'd like to go back into your background. If you want to take us into your early days, your personal journey coming to the state, what was that like getting a D1 athletic scholarship? How did that come about? It's a fun part of my life. I think I, I would like to describe it as such, but I was, my parents were both athletes and I was always involved in sports since early childhood. And in my hometown and on the Croatian national team, there were other athletes, friends of mine who got this opportunity where they were offered scholarships and they came to the United States. And I just saw it as an opportunity, you know, to pursue, to try to build a better life for myself. And at that time, all I really cared was to be a great athlete and to get closer to qualify for the Olympics. And in Croatia, it's a, you know, it's a small country. It's a fairly poor country. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have a lot of great conditions and, and things that especially D1 universities here in the U.S. have. So like we didn't have an indoor track. Our, our weight room was very skimpy, should I say? Mm. <laughs> and so the idea of coming here and having great conditions, I thought, you know, this is just going to bring me so much closer to reaching my athletic potential and, and, mm. and achieving my dreams. The education piece was never an issue for me. I, I love studying. I okay. always say if I could go to school for the rest of my life and not work, I would definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but the idea of, you know, merging the athletic part with with education and having great conditions, having good coaching was really attractive. And so receiving scholarship offers was, was a really fun part of trying to figure out, okay, which university would be good for me. Okay. And so I always look back on that part of my journey as fun and exciting and, and joyful and curious. And, and really, even now, as I reflect back, I still think that was one of the best decisions I made. It's very interesting. I just, I just like to, you know, talk with people who have a different perspective perspective. A lot of international students that I work with, you know, we take the scholarly route of coming to the U.S. just for school, not mm -hmm. anything to do with athletics. How can an international student who's, you know, high level performer, you're looking to come to the U.S., you want to come here for school, but the main route you're going to come here with is through athletics. How can they find that, you know, expose themselves to, to the opportunity? Like in your case, were you scouted? Were you looking out for scouts? How, how did that work? So I was very, very successful early on. I, I competed at world champion, youth world championships, junior world championships, European championships. I think even uh, youth, your your youth Olympic games. And so because I was on the world stage almost every year, I, I would consistently make semifinals and finals at least. And my results were very competitive. They track like 
like coaches, the, the recruiting coaches, they track the, the world rankings. And so personally, in, in, in my case, I didn't have to do a lot of legwork because I was constantly receiving letters at home. I don't know how they found my address, but I was receiving letters with offers and expressing interest. Um, I do have some friends who their journey was slightly different. And so they had this strong desire, but maybe they were not on such a high level uh, with their performance. So they took an approach of reaching out to coaches here in the U.S. and saying, hey, this is my profile. These are my events. These are my results. I'm interested in pursuing education here. Would I meet your criteria? Would there be any, any opportunity for me to come and, and train and compete? compete for your university. And so that's another approach that folks do. I think since 2007, when I came here for, for undergrad, things have advanced quite a bit. And so NCAA now has a portal where you can create a profile, you can put all your stuff in, you can upload the your your videos of your performances. And, and through the portal, it's easier to connect with coaches. But I think either one, you cannot go wrong. If you're interested, you can, coaches' email addresses are available on the website. You just have to search, you know, if you're interested. If you're a tennis player, go to XYZ University, look up the tennis team, look up the coaching staff, and their email addresses are listed. It's a publicly available information. So oh, okay. you can always send an email, say, hey, I'm a prospective student athlete. I'm really mm -hmm. interested. What should I do? You know, and, and, and hopefully you get a response back. Sometimes it requires a little bit more persistence. Right. So don't get discouraged if they don't respond to your first email. Just keep sending emails. Exactly. <laughs> I see. Wow. That's uh, very interesting to know. Different strategy for different folks. Mm -hmm. um, very impressive background you had. So I look at someone from Croatia. You came to the U.S., and um, you went to Nebraska. No offense in Nebraska, but it's not the most <laughs> not the most diverse state in the, in, in the U.S. So <laughs> how was that transition for you? If you remember your early days adjusting to life in the U.S. as an international student, I take it um, English was not your native language coming from Croatia. So you had that language barrier to adapt to. And you also obviously had the cultural barrier as well to overcome. So how was mm -hmm. that? So you you're right. English in English language has been a barrier, but I think my parents value education a lot. Mm -hmm. And so in Croatia, I think starting in fifth grade all the way through high school, it is required that you take English. So everybody mm -hmm. have to study English. Now, the quality of that depends on how much effort you as an individual put into it. But my mom had put me into like private classes to study study English early on when I was even six. So, and I took English in elementary school up to that fifth grade when it became uh, mandatory for everyone. And so I would like to say that I put quite a bit of effort in trying to get good at it or as good as possible especially when I kind of burst at this idea that I don't want to stay here. I want to get out of Croatia. And so I need to make sure that my English is, is good. It wasn't great. It definitely, you know, my first semester at Nebraska, I was walking around with dictionary all the time. It wasn't like now you plug in the word in your phone and magically everything is here. I had a little hand handbook dictionary that I was carrying with me when I was studying for my exams and stuff. I would highlight the words that I wasn't familiar with. So there was a lot of translating back and forth. And I think that really helped because that first semester, even though it was a lot of work and, you know, somebody may say like, why are you wasting time translating words? Just gather the concept. And I was like, that's not how I function. It really set me up and sped up my vocabulary and, and I got more comfortable with just, you know, making mistakes. And my teammates were, I, I had some teammates that were really nice. And I said, please correct me. If I say something, it doesn't make sense. If I mispronounce something, correct me. You're not going to hurt my feelings. I want to learn. I want to get better. And so I had one teammate, Scott, who would always correct me on, on all sorts of things. He would be correcting me. And I never took it as an insult. I never took it in a negative way because I really 
wanted to get better. So so that's how like the language piece went. You 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 also mentioned the culture. Barrier, the culture, so. yeah. yes. In, in Nebraska, being you know predominantly white state, you corn know, huskers. <laughs> yes, corn huskers. Not, not a lot of diversity. Uh -huh. um, you know, in in Croatia, same thing. There's not a lot of racial diversity. Croatia is predominantly white, predominantly Catholic uh, country, so not a lot of racial diversity. And so that was a bit of a shock because even though the university was was not very diverse, my yeah. team had folks from all over the place. My my immediate group, my sprinters and hurdlers, majority of my teammates that I was spending most of my time were African American identified. Mm, you know, okay. there was also a lot of other international students so eventually one of my roommates who is now my best friend she's mm. from latvia you oh, know wow. we had folks from romania from australia a bunch of you know teammates from jamaica barbados mm -hmm. um germany so like nebraska was a very diverse track and field team oh you know, okay. outside of the uh, outside of the track and field team now there was not a lot of diversity this podcast episode is brought to you by the funding masterclass for international students created by sojourning scholar if you are struggling to find ways to fund your international education you can discover the secrets that allowed me to fund my education in the u.s covering hundreds of thousands of dollars in my exclusive free course which you can sign up for at sojourningscholar.com forward slash funding in this course you will learn the strategies and resources I and many international students have utilized to make their educational dreams in the U.S. come true without breaking the bank. Don't miss this unique opportunity to learn how you can make your own study abroad dreams come true. Go to sojourningscholar.com forward slash funding linked in the description section to sign up today. Once again, that's sojourningscholar.com forward slash funding and back to the show. And I think really one of the challenges at the time, I didn't have the concepts and the knowledge to explain <laughs> this, but now I do. And, and and some of those things at the time were very confusing, but I didn't really know what to do with it. But it, it, it ties to identity development, identity formation, you know, okay. and I felt like, yes, I am white. I can acknowledge that that I am white. But at Nebraska, I felt like, oh, I go with African-American students mm. because especially my, my African-American teammates, because they are a minority and I am a minority because mm -hmm. in my mind, I wasn't paying attention to race. I was like, I'm international and, and English is not even my first language. And so mm. they're going to accept me. And sometimes that was not the case. There, there was, you know, that disconnect and not knowing the, the history, not knowing about, you know, the cultural differences here in the United States, because nobody teaches us American mm. history in Croatia. It, it caused a lot of disconnection, you know, mm. like I'm trying to fit, but I'm not quite accepted, mm. but I'm also not accepted by my white teammates who mm. were American fully. And so now I know all these, you know, the nuance. Of, yeah. Yes. Nuances that like, wow. okay, well, history is important. And now mm -hmm. I know why we're, they weren't accepting me because they saw me as a white person. Mm. And, and at the time I wasn't grasping that I didn't have that level of knowledge. I didn't have that level of awareness. I didn't know where it's coming from. And so like, it was really hard to acknowledge that. Yeah, it's a very interesting perspective. So taking a look at your journey as you transitioned away from the amateur space in college mm -hmm. and then going into being a professional athlete mm -hmm. and also transitioning further to becoming a mental health um, professional mm -hmm. where you find yourself today is this something you always wanted to do did you always want to work in this area of mental health yes i was very passionate about psychology since high school you know i at the time i worked with a sports clinician that was very helpful in my journey and just learning how to prepare learning how to overcome obstacles learning mental skills to improve my performance on the field and i always thought you know what when i grow up i want to do for others what she did for me and so there was that always that component of sports psychology that i was interested in throughout my journey things kind of shifted because i'm sure as you know as an international student sometimes you can't really pursue directly what you really want to pursue you kind of have to take detours 
And, and sometimes you go in a one way street and sometimes you get to the dead end, you have to go back. And so I feel a lot of my journey was like that. You know, I, I graduated and it was 2011 and 2012 was Olympic year. And I didn't think at the time, okay, now I need to continue my education. My only thing on my mind was I want to qualify for Beijing Olympics in 2008. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, 2012 was London. And unfortunately, things didn't work out. I, I ended up getting hurt in February. I fell a practice and I, I broke a piece of bone in my ankle that I didn't know was broken. So I continued to run and train and all that sort of things with pain getting worse, which was really, you know, heartbreaking and devastating. And part of me really was in denial and not wanting to accept the fact that, you know, you're constantly in pain, your times are not improving, your range of motion is being limited. It's time to just, you know, face the facts. And so I ended up having surgery in August and, and recovery took a while. And that year I was also an OPT, optical practical training. And so that was coming to an end and I was like, well, how do I stay in the U S and continue, you know, training and pursuing my dream. Mm -hmm. And so I felt at the time, the easiest way to do that is to go back to school. Um, and so I, I got accepted into a master's program and that's how, you know, that part of the journey started, but also I was working with a coach. I didn't want to move. I was at that time in Columbia, South Carolina, okay. and I didn't want to change coaches. And so I was looking for a program that was in Columbia or in a driving distance so that I wouldn't have to completely uproot my life and change it. And so I, I got into clinical mental health counseling program and I was like, okay, it's not psychology. It's not clinical mm -hmm. psychology, but this program is still going to allow me to do ultimately what I want to do. And, and I felt confident about that because I reached out to professionals in the field who were more seasoned mm -hmm. and everybody that I spoke with shared a different journey. They had different masters, different PhD, different specialization. And so I sort of felt, you know what, I'm just going to create my own path and I'm going to trust that things are going to work out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think now I may be deviating from your question. So put me back on track. No, no, no. I think that's perfect. I love it. I love the direction. You no, know, I think it's good to see like where that came from. So while you were transitioning from being an athlete, the way you find yourself today, some of those based on what you said was spurred by what you went through, right? So mm -hmm. Some of those challenges you faced in your professional career, being hurt in an injury, your entire goal ever since you came to the States, the Olympics was your destination. That was, that was it. You were just training yes. for the Olympics. And so I can only imagine that having gone through that challenge, I think it forced you to understand that if you could overcome whatever mental health obstacles you had, there, there were lots of other people in that community who could benefit from it. That's what I'm taking mm -hmm. from your conversation. Yes. Yes. And I think also, especially when, when I work with athletes or student athletes, my journey gives me a lot of credibility because when we speak, they're like, okay, you were an athlete, you went to D1, you were injured, you had a serious injury, you had a surgery, you know, if I'm working with international student athlete, you know, again, that part of the shared identity, again, gives me more credibility because they're dealing with visa and immigration challenges. They're dealing with certain requirements and all of that has an impact on one's well-being and, and, oh, and absolutely. mental health overall. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really, really interesting. And that intersection of mental health and sports with your passion of being an international student and also supporting the international student community, mm -hmm. I think, um, it's a great segue to how we met. So just a background story. I came across honors article published in the university of Texas international students newsletter, and she had an article on cultural adjustments and the truths around studying abroad as an international student that a lot of people did not talk about. About. And if you're mm -hmm. watching this, whether you're a current international student or a new international student, it's a very sensitive topic. It's not the most exciting, but I think it's something that everyone who's about to embark on this journey should know about. Mm -hmm. And Honor, one of your articles you published was about navigating cultural shock, mm -hmm. which is, I think, you know, I don't think that's an aspect of a journey that anyone can sidestep. If you're going to be an international student, you're going to face cultural shock to some extent. Mm -hmm. And it's perfect to have you talk about that topic. Um, looking at your article, you talk about the four stages of cultural adaptation 
Yes. The four stages you start off with the honeymoon stage mm -hmm. and then you transition to the anxiety stage. And I'm referencing this image here from the virtualeducation.org website. It's part of your blog article. Mm -hmm. This anxiety stage, you refer to that as a stage of trying to figure out, you know, how to deal with culture shock. The anxiety stage mm -hmm. is where culture shock sets in. And then you talk about your adjustment stage and going to the acceptance stage. Can you just walk us through each of these stages? And also important from the perspective of an international student, how can someone identify when they're in each of these stages? Yes. So excellent. And I'm glad that you have this little graph up here. Um, this graph is actually a little outdated. It's coming from Trifonovich study that was done in 1977. Since then, there have been a couple other um, researchers that have added slight deviations, but it, it I, I like this one because it presents things in a very clear way. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm happy to walk you through it. And I think every international um, student, whether they're, you know, focused on academics or they're, they're an athlete, they go through this in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And so the honeymoon stage, the Trifonovich, Kapsa, and Peterson, they all call it the same way. They all called it the honeymoon. But during the, the honeymoon stage, everything is new, everything is flashy, everything is interesting. It, it The students, international students feel like, you know, I have been working towards this dream for a really long time and, and I finally achieved it. It's sort of like right. a bliss. There's a lot of excitement. There's a lot of curiosity. There's a lot of joy. Um, They want to try everything out. And there's really very, very little anxiety about, you know, what is unknown because mm -hmm. everything is new and everything is interesting at this point. Uh, from the honeymoon, things go into what Trifonovich calls anxiety, which is down this fall. Kapsa and Peterson, the second stage, they call it disintegration or the fall because really it is the most painful state. Um, there is a lot of complex states where the students may experience confusion. They may feel disoriented. They may feel um, confused about what is expected of me versus what is expected of others. And how do I figure out how to meet those expectations? Um, they may experience a sense of disconnection from what they are surrounded with. They may experience a sense of failure, like I'm not doing good enough, I'm failing. The homesickness becomes more prevalent during this stage as well. They may feel overwhelmed by the amount of information that they are trying to figure out, whether that is related to cultural differences, to academics, the professors, you know, using the canvas or the blackboard. Like in Croatia, we don't have that thing. So like, I was like, oh my goodness, like, how do I navigate all of this? Right. In Nebraska, I use Blackboard. And when I moved to, for my master's and my PhD, they use the, the, the canvas. I'm like, okay, so now I have to learn like a whole new system that works completely different. So that, that's, that's overwhelming. Um, but also during this stage, students become more aware of all of these differences, which contributes to these incongruencies. And they also may start to withdrawing and, and, and isolating themselves because everything is so overwhelmed. So now we're like down in the anxiety stage. So mm -hmm. the third stage, Trifonovich had four that he calls it adjustment, but Cups and Peterson now break the adjustment into two additional stages. So the next one, according to Cups and Peterson, is reintegration or learning how to walk. And this really is another quite challenging stage because international students may experience increased levels of hostility or anger. Mm. And that is directed towards others. Like they don't understand me, why they, can't, why they can't just help me or why they don't understand that this is how things work in my culture or in my country. Um, they may also experience a strong rejection of the host culture, so of what is happening in the U.S. They may also experience cognitive dissonance things like, oh, I'm here, but I feel bad. Or, you know, I'm here, things are better, but like my family may still be struggling back mm -hmm. home or like feeling guilty that quality of their life is better than the quality of life that they might have experienced back in their home country. However, on the flip side, they're getting a little bit better in managing their tasks, managing okay. their responsibilities. So this is slowly where their adjustment is starting to kick in as they're establishing 
establishing routines for how they want to do, when they need to do things, how to prioritize things. And they may feel a little bit more grounded in their own identity mm -hmm. while they're developing new aspects of the identity as a result of experiences here in the U.S. So from the reintegration and learning how to walk, now we move to a little up higher on the adjustment here. That fourth one, Cupsa and Peterson call it autonomy or juggling. Okay. And so during this stage, students become more organized. They have developed new perspectives. They have learned new skills, maybe because they were forced to on their own, but maybe also because their peers told them, try this. Or maybe they sought some help. Maybe they, they, they talk to a career counselor or they come to meet with a mental health counselor or they spoke with their advisor or, you know, they used various campus resources that allow them to learn different skills to better manage their life. And they're also developing more understanding about the host culture. So how things function in the U.S. What is it that U.S. culture value? They're getting better at balancing all these responsibilities. So their personal life, their school, family, work, if they're working, you know, their, their leisure activities, hobbies. Now they're more comfortable juggling all of them. And they're also increasing, you know, continuing to increase their level of awareness and feeling more independent, more autonomous. So as a result of that, they also tend to relax a little bit and feel maybe more empathetic. Okay. And then from there, we move to the, I don't want to say final stage because the adjustment, you know, the adjustment and, 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 and the acculturation piece mm -hmm. never really ends. That, that is true. Of, yep. It's, it's a continuous process for as long as you are here. That is true. So I, I want to, you know, just name that, that it's not the end of the process. It continues. Trifanovic calls this stage as acceptance. Cups and Peterson calls it interdependence or mm -hmm. walking in juggling and basically students ha have gotten to a point where they allow themselves to honor their culture their cultural identity while at the same time accepting parts of a new culture mm. so it's not either or it's not like rejecting this and rejecting this no i'm honoring where i came from i'm honoring my cultural values i'm honoring my cultural heritage and mm -hmm. i'm starting to accept things that i need to accept to be able to find function in this society here in the U.S. They also start to feel more like home. So this is now their second home here in the U.S. And, and they're forming this multicultural or bicultural identity where they're more flexible, they're more adaptable, um, they're able to adjust to different cultural contexts, whether they're in a classroom or they're at some sort of event or they're at an interview. Now they have more knowledge and understanding of that. Really, they're accepting now the fact that, you know, this is working progress and, and I'm just going to have to continually learn and adjust. And something that I want to note is that we are, we know of these stages, but there's no research that says, okay, this stage lasts this many weeks or months. This stage lasts this many weeks or months. That is very individualized. Every person may go through these stages and, and spend different amount of time in them. Some of them may even like backtrack a little bit and then move forward. Sometimes you experience this when you come and then maybe you choose to go home for the summer. And when you come back, you may go through this, this little roller coaster again, but it's going to be much faster the second round because now you know what to expect. But that incongruence, you may experience it upon your return back into the U.S. I, I mentioned earlier, I have been here for 17 years now. I feel I'm still trying to learn. I'm still very intentionally working on adjusting my identity and learning different things from my past and how that is impacting me today. And do I need to adjust that? Do I, is there something new that I need to accept or figure out mm -hmm. how does that fit within my life, within my life experiences? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's very important to point out the fact that, you know, it's very personal. So you should never feel pressure if someone else goes through the same phase in a much shorter time and you find yourself dwelling in, in the same phase for a much longer time. I think that's that's very critical. One other thing I would like to ask on this topic of cultural adaptation from your experience, mm -hmm. are there any specific tools or strategies you think that, you know, people could be aware of as they go through this process, especially for international students? In the US? Yeah, you know, 
again, this could be very individualized, but something that I often talk to students is, you know, be aware or spend some time thinking about what your core values are. Like, what is it that you believe when it comes to family? What is it that you value and believe when it comes to education? What it is that you value and believe when it comes to friendships? Mm -hmm. And being more aware and grounded in your core values is going to put an individual in a position to identify, okay, how are things different here in the U.S.? There are some different values and, and I don't have to abandon my values and conform to these values, but I can be aware, right? I think one very big thing in, in my experience working with international student population is that a lot of international students come from collectivistic cultures where, you know, there's a lot of uh, dependence and reliance on family and friends and that Im immediate network. And when you come here to the U.S., you don't have anyone. You're alone. All your closest people are like on the other side of the world, seven, eight, ten thousand 10,000 miles away. And, and that's, that's huge. And we often forget that we build those friendships across our lifespan. And now we come here and we are having a difficult time connecting with people or finding people we can trust and rely on. And, and, and sometimes those core values can be, being aware of that can help you find people that align with what you believe in, right? So, so core values is one thing. Something else that I would say, it's always good to practice awareness. Like, can I pay attention to what's happening? Can I pay attention to how is this making me feel? It may not resolve anything, but you acknowledging and validating your experience is therapeutic in and of itself. And you do not need to talk to a therapist to do that. Mm. You know, sometimes it's okay to say, you know what, this is really confusing and I don't know what the heck to do with this, mm -hmm. but I'm just going to sit with being confused for the next 30 seconds. And then I'm going to move on and try to figure out what do I do? Yeah. That's really good to know. Awareness is key. Awareness is mm -hmm. very, very critical. You know, another article of yours on the truth about studying abroad that no one talks about i i found this theme that i call the silence of struggle you mentioned in the article that pride guilt and shame might prevent students from sharing their true experience and if i quote you clearly you said you might push through days with a, a simple smile on your face telling folks back home that everything is okay after all who wants their mother or father who are eight thousand miles away to worry about something that they cannot do anything about mm -hmm. that that is like you could not have put that in better words and that's that's a topic that so many international students I know absolutely face. It's a critical issue a lot of them face. And mm -hmm. I'd I'll, I'll like to know, is there anything, you know, can international students, what do you think about how they can find safe spaces or communities where they feel comfortable sharing their struggles? You know, I I'm glad you're bringing that up because oftentimes that was exactly my experience too, you know, going through stuff and, and I don't want to call my mom mm -hmm. and, and make her cry and make her sad. And, and then we get off the phone. She's not going to stop being sad. She's going to continue being sad. And on top of that worry, and there's nothing she can do. And so in terms of what international students can do, you know, here at UT, I think every university is doing some form of this. You just okay. may have to look for it and, and find. But international students, color offices, put up a lot of events. Some of them are to provide you with resources. Others are simply like social gatherings. And, and I think that if international students can find some time in their schedule to attend those and put themselves in the position to meet people, to develop support network, these are not going to be their best friends immediately, but you're going to put yourself in a position to meet other people who are going through the same or similar things as you're going through, you're not going to feel alone. I was just talking about this the other day. There's something called propinquity, where when you're putting yourself in, in, in position where you're seeing same people over and over again, it makes it easier to initiate that conversation, to start that friendship. And those are then the, the, the factors that you can rely on and say, you know what, I can talk to so-and-so because they are going through what I'm going through and they're not gonna judge me. They're not gonna think, 
less of me. They're not going to talk down on me, but it may be easier to talk to them than to call my family. You know, putting some emphasis on taking advantage of the programming that your university offers, whether that is put on by international student and scholar office, or it's put on by different offices on campus, like career engagement office or counseling and psychological uh, center, or maybe it's put on by multicultural center, or maybe it's put on, I don't know, by scholarship office. Like all of these different campus departments have something that they are doing for students. Some of it can be specific to international students, but other programming is for everyone. Those things are all there for, for students to take advantage of. And I oftentimes use the term like milk the system. Go and take advantage of it. Even if you walk out of this with one piece of information, you benefit. Sometimes you may walk out of it with one or two new friends that you didn't have before. And that is easing that part of not feeling alone, preventing you maybe from isolating and developing, you taking the initiative to, to develop a support network mm -hmm. that can help you here. So you're not only depending on people back. Home. Absolutely. Yeah, that is critical. When you talk about building a support system, I think it's also good to talk about asking for help. Mm -hmm. And this is where the subject of removing the stigma of mental health comes into play. Mm -hmm. um, you've worked in this space for quite a long time. What are some ways you can find to broach that topic of the stigmatization of mental health across the international student community? Yeah, yeah, great question. I think there's also a lot of research that supports that international students have a difficult time asking for help. And my approach, a lot of it was driven based on my own personal experiences, is that knowing that international students do not like to ask for help, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, when they do ask for help, things have already hit the fan, have escalated, maybe chronic, and it makes it so much harder to alleviate that distress and provide sufficient support. And knowing that there is stigma and shame related to mental health in mm -hmm. specific, I try to do things that are not in a mental health space. So we are talking about mental health. We are talking about coping skills. We are talking about life skills. We are mm -hmm. talking about, you know, emotions and, and we are talking about trauma. Sometimes we are talking about cultural values. We are mm -hmm. talking about the same thing that we just reviewed, the, the adjustments of the, the stages of culture shock and adjustment and acculturation. Mm -hmm. But I do all of those things in collaboration with another campus office. And I do it in a place where where international students feel more comfortable. So, you know, even before we, we jumped on this, on recording the podcast, I mentioned, I, I go to the apartment complex where majority of international students live and we meet, mm -hmm. we organize a, a social event in the community room, right? Mm -hmm. So in the community room, we always have some food. We always have some snacks because if you have food, <laughs> people are going to show gonna up. They're going to come. <laughs> yes. And then I also always try to make it interactive. So you're not mm -hmm. coming to a lecture where like now there, this lady is going to talk to you about stuff, but I'm going to talk about something and then I'm going to mm -hmm. give you a worksheet or we're going to facilitate a discussion. So by the time I finish, you're leaving with something that it's tangential, something that you mm -hmm. can say, you know what? I now know how to put this into practice and mm -hmm. this is how this would fit into my life. So that's, that's my philosophy that how can I meet them in a spaces where they're comfortable? How can I provide them with some psychoeducation, give them some background, some context, some examples, and how can I give them a few tools that now they are knowledgeable and comfortable to put into practice. And I think it's a great message, uh, what you just explained, some of the things you found working for you. You find that, would you say it's a good message to other educators or other institutions that have international students? Is that something that they can emulate? I would say yes. Because the, 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 the way the research is done, it shows us that they are not keen on asking for help, which means that it is our responsibility to figure out other ways to meet other ways where we can deliver them, you know, information and knowledge and resources. Now, 
whether or not they're going to use it, that's another part of the story. But if we, and, and somebody I was presenting yesterday to academic advisors and somebody asked the question, you know, what should we do? Repeat, 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 repeat. Every time you meet a student, hey, did you use any of the things? Did you need any of the things that I told you about last time? Here it is again. Here's the writing center. Here's the career center. Here's the, you know, tutoring center. Here's the mental health center. Here's the university health center. So give them all those things over and over and over again. So they're aware of it because they may not need it. They may be afraid of using it, but if they hear it from you 15 times, eventually they're going to take advantage of it. And, and doing so in non-threatening way also helps. Sometimes I talk about it. Sometimes I give them a little piece of paper that has a list of all these resources. You know what? Review this. You know, if you have any questions, email me. Happy to chat more about it. And, and simply because we know they don't like to ask for help, we know they don't like to come to the mental health center, and there's research that supports that, I feel like it is our responsibility, um, responsibility of an institution to bridge that gap. How can we continue to break down that stigma? How can we meet students where they are versus expecting them to come to us knowing that there's shame, there's stigma, there's cultural differences, there's familiar pressure, there's familial stigma. You know, some families and some cultures, we don't talk about mental health. We don't ask for help. Family stuff stays within the family. It's going to be extremely hard for those folks to, to come and say like, hey, I'm depressed or hey, I'm not sleeping well because I'm constantly constantly thinking and thinking and overthinking. They're not going to do that. That is a fact. I'd like to conclude this um, conversation by leaving you with one question of if you had to go back to the start and you were giving advice to your younger self, what advice, what, what what's the one key piece of wisdom you think you would offer to a new international student like yourself embarking on this journey about the realities that they're going to face? You know, one thing that, that in a sense I regret, especially during my undergraduate journey, is that I did not invest in friendships. I did not invest time in developing meaningful friendships with more people. So I became friends. I had good friendships with my teammates. But other than that, I, I prioritized my recovery. I prioritized my training. So I rarely attended social events on campus. And I feel like if I would have, I would have more friends now. I would have bigger social support network. And it would also have allowed me to learn more about other people's experience. So I think that's one thing that if I could, if I could go back and tell my younger self would be, you know, go to that pizza hour, go to that karaoke thing, you know, go to this career class, even though you don't need this right now, just go to be around people, go to meet people, go to learn from other people. That would be one thing that I would have done different if I could oh, go back. So true. I resonate 1000% with that experience. My first year as an international student, I felt like I, you know, I stayed away from a lot of those social gatherings or mm -hmm. if I did attend those social gatherings, it's because I was forced into it. But uh, I think looking back, one of the main assets you can get from your college experience, forget about the degree you have is really just a piece of paper at the end of the day, but the value of the network you're going to build. I think that's one of the best things you can get from your college experience. And mm -hmm. What Arna yeah. has just said here is exactly true. You got to take advantage of your environment and really ex expose yourself to, you know, whatever your, your, your fears are about meeting new people. It's all part of the learning journey and her advice is worth its weight in gold. Dr. Honor, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Can you tell people about where they can get more from you and what you have to offer? Sure. So one way is, you know, University of Texas publishes my blog posts on various topics multiple times a semester. I publish things on my own website, drarnaeriga.com. Sometimes it's about international students. Other times it's more about sports psychology and developing mental skills, which I think everyone can benefit from. And mm -hmm. if folks ever have any questions, you can feel free to email me through my website. Absolutely. Thank you once again for coming on the podcast. And we look forward to connecting with you in the future. Thank you so much, Chucky, for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Awesome. Take care.